Well, it is nice to see all of you again, and this is such an exciting time. An ordination of a pastor is an unbelievable experience. Some of us attend ordinations quite regularly, and we always think back to our own ordination. And I'll tell you one little story about mine, because it's a bit of amusing, except to me. So at this ordination, there was a member of our congregation who went to high school with me. I never met him, because I went to a high school of 600 senior graduates. And, uh, but he kept his yearbook. And he gave it to the pastor, who was my friend, who was doing the ordination, and put it up. And in the book, it said, career goal, under my name, be a Lutheran minister. Pet peeve, bleach blondes. And he put it up for everybody. And sitting in the first pew was Barbara and my two oldest grandchildren, who were going to put the stole on me. And my grandson reaches over and says to me, what's with the bleach blondes? So I don't think we'll have anything like that today, but it was, it was. It's an exciting time for sure. Today we're focusing on the gospel lesson, which is the feeding of the 5,000. Actually, it probably was a lot more than 5,000 because in Matthew's description it says 5,000 men and women and children. So it could have been 20,000, 15, who knows? It's probably one of the best known um, um, miracles in the Bible. There's about 37 miracles that Jesus performed, but we don't know all of them because John in his writing says, I am writing this because I want you to know that this is Jesus, the Son of God. But there are so many more things that could fill books that I can't write about. And of course, the greatest miracle of all wasn't one that Jesus performed. It was the miracle of his birth, death, and resurrection. That was a miracle. And a miracle is interesting because it's not something we can really understand. It's not scientific. We can't get our arms around it. We have to accept it really just by faith. But there are miracles every day. I've seen miracles. I don't know about you. I've seen them in, in my, when I was the trustee of the hospital. You probably have seen them. Sometimes prayer brings on miracles or miracles come through other people. In the medical profession, we see miracles through doctors all the time. Sometimes a doctor will say, I can't cure this person, and all of a sudden they're cured. So miracles are here and still available and still can be found if we look for them. Sometimes when there's a serious event, like remember when the plane crashed over on Route 75, the um, three people walked out of a burning plane unscathed. It was a miracle. So we've seen many things like that over the years. Miracles do exist. They're just not historic events. But I think this miracle we should take a little time to think about because there's more to it really than just the event itself, the, the feeding of the 5,000 with the fish and the loaves. If you go back to the very beginning of this gospel, it's something we don't focus on very much. But Jesus did something very unusual. He took his disciples, and keep in mind this is very early in his life or in his ministry, and they were still mourning the death of John the Baptist. And he took his 12 disciples and sent them out without him. Go out and do ministry. And the, and the scriptures say they cured people, they drove out demons, they taught. And then they came back. They came back and they were very anxious to tell Jesus all that had happened to them. It must have been very stressful if you can think about it. These 12 young people, having only met Jesus maybe months before, are out doing these things. But when Jesus saw them, he said, you know, let's go to a desolate place. You need some rest and you need something to eat. And they were all charged up. You know how it is when kids come over, they're all charged up. And so they tried to get, they got on a boat to go off to a quiet place. And maybe that's one of the first lessons from this parable. It's important to seek rest in your life, to spend time taking stock of yourself. This is a very busy society. Many of you probably work more than one job. It's hard to find time. One retired person said to me recently, you know the problem with retirement? You never get a day off. And you know some people go into retirement, but then they go crazy because they're afraid they're not going to have anything to do, and they wind up doing more than they did before. But a good lesson from Jesus is you need some rest, even some spiritual rest. But they had no time because the crowds were right there and they wanted to hear more. 
you know, they knew Jesus was a healer. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to hear more about him. He didn't know who they were. Were they Jews? Probably some. Were they Gentiles? Probably some. Who knows who they were? Just a large group of people. And as the day wore on, wore on the disciples said, you know, these people are hungry. They were probably hungry too. But they didn't have a lot of compassion. What was their answer? Just send them away. Tell them to go into the villages. Go buy some food. How often in life, when we see people needing help, do we say, go take care of yourself. Fix this yourself. I, I don't have time for this. Then they said, well, should we go buy food with 200 denarii, a lot of money? And Jesus said, well, what do we have? What do you have here? And he told them in the parable, loaves, two lo loaves, five loaves, and two fish. And then he did something very interesting. He just didn't, com he just didn't do this miracle. He sat them down in an organized way. He put groups of 50 here, groups of 100 here, so that when he was going to feed them, there wouldn't be chaos. Jesus was very practical of everything else. And then he committed the miracle, prayed, and had plenty of food for everybody, a banquet. That's, that, that's the miracle. Maybe the best known in the Bible. Maybe the most important. And there's three things to me that comes out of what he did. One was he showed his divine power over creation. I mean, who could do this? Who could take two fish and five loaves and create a feast for five or 10,000 people? It's unexplainable. Secondly, he showed his disciples that everything doesn't come according to plan. And that's a message for you and I out of this parable. Everything in our life is not going to come according to plan. And sometimes when it doesn't, we either say, well, I don't know why, why didn't God answer my prayers or where is God in my life? We never know when things are going to change or what things are going to do. But he showed them, be prepared. And we as Christians need to be prepared as well. And the third thing, and maybe the most important thing, and the most lesson to you and I is he showed compassion. These people were tired and hungry, and he wanted to deal with their everyday needs, the need for food and rest. And so to you and I, Christ always shows compassion. We may not always see it clearly, but you can be assured that if he showed compassion to 5,000 people in the field, he shows compassion to you every day of your life. Now, of course, for the people of the time, it was good because they could come and see Jesus in person. They could come and see him and see a miracle and be healed. We don't have that luck, that privilege. We're not there. We have to see him through other ways. See him through prayer, through the sacraments, through the scriptures. But Barbara gave me an article a couple weeks ago, and it sort of talked about this problem of people saw Jesus personally and we don't. And you know, Peter and, and John were very nervous about this in their writings, and John specifically said, I am writing so that people will believe the story. Because I think they knew the more time that goes on, the tougher the story is to believe. And we know now there's a lot of Christians not sure anymore, turning away. And the longer it goes, the more that's possible. And you and I have to try to put a stop to that for ourselves and for, and for others. In life, when we have a problem, let's say we have a medical emergency. Maybe you know about that. Let's say we're in an automobile accident or someone tries to break into our house. What do we do? We dial 911. And generally we get pretty good response, although there's been some articles recently where 911 is, it was really bad shape Friday, but 911 is getting overwhelmed by people because they call because their cat's in a tree or they lost their wallet or some other thing. But they don't know what to do, so they call 911. Do you know that system, 911, is not Euclid American? Where I travel around the world, every country I've ever gone to has a system like this. I'll give you a couple examples. In the UK, it's 999. In most of Europe, it's 112. 
In Australia, it's 000. In Thailand, it's 191. But China takes the cake because China, with their vast amount of people, know that one number may not work. So they have three numbers. So they have a number, if you need an ambulance, you call 120. If you need, if you, um, need the police or an accident, you call 112. And if there's a fire, you call 119. And I'm thinking, I can even remember. I have to get a piece of paper and put it in my wallet so I know what number to call. But it's the way we call for help. So I was reading an article that Barb gave me, and it talked about how the people get help through the scripture when the scripture can be complicated. We all know many of us don't read the Bible as much as we should. Sometimes we get, get tied up in things we don't know. It seems complicated. But is there a way that scripture can speak to us plainly in certain conditions of our life? So I named this the 911 of scripture. And I picked out five or six places where you and I can go for specific things and get very direct advice, mostly from Jesus, but some from the Old Testament. Let me give you some examples. The first one is faith. Faith is a gift. We have it. But you can't just leave it sit there. You've got to do something with it, or else you can kind of lose it. It can become less important in your life. For many people, faith is not the foundation. It's the most powerful gift in the world, and yet many people don't see it that way. It's just something they know. But do they exercise it? Are they strong about it? Not so much. A lot of people, a lot of young people turning away from the, maybe not from their faith, but from the church for sure. Faith gets weakened. It's not something you can just say, I have it, I don't have to worry about it. So if you really had that, that incident, if you're really in a situation where you feel your faith is a little bit small, I'll give you the number to call. Call 911-John316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him shall never die but have eternal life. You don't have to know anything else about the Bible except that verse. That is the foundation of your faith. It is God's promise from Genesis on, that one verse. It's the basis of all scripture. And sometimes when we have a verse like that that we know so well, it's just sort of like routine, you know? We know it, but do we really think about it? So in those days, if your faith gets a little bit weak, dial 991, John 3.16, toll free, by the way. Suppose you're suffering from problems. Things are going wrong in your life. And you wonder where Christ is. Where is Jesus? Does he really know me? Does he have a plan? I have a sudden illness. I was perfectly healthy yesterday. I'm not so good today. I have someone very sick in the family. I'm not sure they're going to live. What, what, what could we do? We go to one of my favorite books of the Bible and one of my favorite passages. So what you should do is this. Call 911-1 Peter 1. And I'll read it to you. Praise be to you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that can never be, ever perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you through faith for whom God shields by God's powerful, powerful power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come to you that your faith, greater worth than gold, which perishes although refined, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus was revealed. That you not have seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you are filled with an impressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That is so reassuring that just short verses to remind you that Christianity isn't perfect. It's not easy. 
and you're going to have trials. But Peter, in writing this, knew that. He lived it. And he reminds you and I to put our faith in context. And when we have issues and trouble, go to prayer, go to Christ, come to Christ. Because in the end, the most important thing is the salvation of your souls. And that is his unconditional promise. Well, maybe you're suffering from stress. This is a very stressful world. We get stressed in the church sometimes. Would you get stressed by this? I have a feeling Pastor Duncan might have been a little stressful coming down here to a new place, a new congregation, to an ordination. I'd be stressful. Well, what should you do if you're under stress? Can you get some good practical advice from Jesus? Of course you can. So if you're feeling stressful, dial 911, Matthew 11, 25. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Some advice if you're stressful. And then what about if you're lonely? You know, New York City is known as the loneliest, largest city in the world. You can have millions of people around you, and you feel by yourself. Sometimes we see people who are lonely, and we don't do anything about it. Lonely is a very bad condition. It can lead to depression and worse. What happens if you're lonely? What can we do? Dial 911, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leaves me beside still waters. He restores my soul. The answer is, if you are in Christ, you are never alone. You always have someone in your life, someone you can talk to, someone you can count on, never alone. And lastly, what if it, you feel like you really would like to hear a blessing from Jesus, a personal one? Dial 911. John 21, 29. Remember what he said to Thomas. Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That's you and me. We have not really seen, but we are blessed because of our faith and what we believe in. Lastly, what about worry? Here's another condition. We all have worry. We worry about, I know people that worry about everything. It doesn't matter what it is, they worry about it. They worry about getting on a plane because they know it's going to crash. They worry about driving long distances because they might run out of gas. They worry about pulling food and worry, worry, worry. That's a common condition. And it can get you down. I know sometimes it gets me down. What do you do? Dial 911, Matthew 11:28. 28. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Who of you by worrying can add one single hour to your life? That's pretty good advice. It puts things in perspective, doesn't it? So what's the point of all this? The point of all this is we can come to Christ too, even though not in person. We can come just as those people came to him in that grassy field. We can find in the scriptures very clear, common advice for life's conditions. And all we have to do is not struggle through the whole Bible, but just have a few verses that speak to you personally. And I hope this morning some of these verses in our spiritual 911 speak to you personally. In the name of Christ, amen. And the peace of God, which is above all our understanding, keep your hearts and mind through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to bring forth your offerings for the work of the church. <laughs>